You are going to do kid dismissal, right? Yes. After. Okay. Yes. You made it. Right on time. I'm Oh, right. I forgot. Hey, good morning, church. Let's put our hands together, y'all. All things bright and beautiful you are. All things wise and wonderful you are. In my darkest A song will rise, I will sing a song of hope, sing along, God of heaven come down, heaven come down, just to know that you are near is enough, God of heaven come down, heaven come down, yeah. Sing along, God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Thank you, Witness. Good morning, everyone. You can be seated for just a few moments. <laughs> it's good to see all of you. Welcome to Foothills United Methodist Church as we gather together for worship, both in person and online. And we continue in this season of Lent our journey with Christ as we come closer to Holy Week and celebrating new life on Easter. Okay, now I'm going to make you stand back up if you're with us in person <laughs> and greet your friends and loved ones gathered around you today. Once again, welcome everyone. We have a number of 
activities, ministries, programs going on in this season, so we want to make you aware of some of those opportunities and invite you to take part in them where you feel called. Uh, first, we want to remind you that our new bishop, uh, who started January 1st, Bishop Dottie Escobedo Frank, is in San Diego today. She's at First Church in Mission Valley, and she is having a time for meeting and greeting laity, uh, members of our congregation. So if you'd like, you can join her at 3 o'clock this afternoon uh, in Mission Valley, and it'll be a great time to meet her. Wonderful person, very down to earth, and will be a great leader for us. Also here on our campus, we have what we call taco time. It's not always tacos. I think we have enchiladas tonight. Seriously. <laughs> taco stands for taking care of others, and uh, it's sponsored and hosted by our family ministries, and we gather together for food and fellowship, and then a service opportunity, and I believe we'll be making Easter cards for loved ones, so you're invited to take part in that, 4 p.m., in the Zerbe building right next door. Also want to remind you that our Lenten study continues on Wednesdays at 6.30. If you are part of Moms Connect, uh, I know that you are gathering this week, Wednesday at 6 p.m. in the small group room, and then you'll be joining us for the Lenten study. So for all moms, we hope that you'll join for that opportunity. In terms of service, we have our Common Ground Collaborative. That's where we work together with Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church and Santa Sofia Catholic Church in Casa de Oro. And we serve families in the La Mesa Spring Valley School District. And we have a tradition of providing food boxes for low-income families during their spring break. So we're wrapping that up. All of us are chipping in different items we need. Uh, we are doing the combo of applesauce and ramen. Mmm, that tastes good together, right? And uh, if you can't bring an item, uh, you we're invited to donate to this effort. Uh, next Sunday is our last Sunday for collecting items, and we'll be packing those boxes. So we hope that uh, you'll participate in that. Also, uh, we invite you to join us for our church council meeting uh, for this quarter. It happens next Sunday, March 26th. That's hybrid, both in person and online, uh, in King Hall, 12 noon. We'll have a light lunch, and then you can hear updates uh, about our ministries and programs and all that we're doing here at Foothills and Good Shepherd and the Faith Academy. Last but not least, following the service, of course, drop by the coffee cart. Uh, afterwards, have a refreshment, and you'll learn more about prayer quilt ministry, but you're going to learn a lot more right now. So I'm going to invite Leah to come forward and any other volunteers from prayer quilt ministry. Uh, you can see all the beautiful quilts around you right now. And they'll let you know how this started and what it's doing. Good morning and happy Sunday. The prayer quilt ministry is hosting Coffee Cart today. We thought it would be a great time to remind the congregation about the prayer quilt ministry and how it is here to serve you. Can you touch a prayer? Can you pull it close and feel its comfort? That's what a prayer quilt is designed to do bring a tangible sign to that awesome, intangible act of prayer to someone in need. The founding organization, Prayers and Squares, was originally formed in 1992 right here in San Diego at Hope United Methodist Church. Our very own Foothills United Methodist Church joined the organization in 1998 as chapter number three. Kathy Cueva was instrumental in providing key leadership at Foothills. There are now thousands of chapters worldwide. We here at Foothills have been involved for 25 years and are still going strong. Over the years, here at Foothills, we have given out hundreds and hundreds of quilts. How many do you think? Over 2,700 quilts. That's a lot of prayers. The prayer quilt ministry is pretty simple in concept. Unlike the Old Testament, we only have three commandments. Number one, it's not about the quilt, it's about the prayers. Number two, the recipients must be asked if they would like a prayer quilt and be involved in the information shared. And third, prayer quilts are gifts and are not to be bought or sold. That's it, pretty simple. 
How do you get the ball rolling? Just call Chrissy Baker in the office. She coordinates the quilt requests. If you'd like to get a jump start, there are forms in the Narthex outlining the information Chrissy will need you to provide. Interested in joining us? All you need to know is how to sew a straight line. We meet in the Disciple Room the fourth Saturday of every month. We'd love to have you join us. In summary, do you know someone who needs to be touched by a prayer? The Prayer Quilt Ministry is here to serve you and those you love. Thank you. Thank you to all uh, involved in prayer quilt ministry. It's a, it's a long-standing and very active ministry of our church and has impacted so many lives. We have three prayer quilts today that we'll be praying over that will be helping others in need. So learn more about them. Stop by, talk about it at Coffee Cart following the service. Okay, Pastor Christy is going to lead us uh, now in her next video, and we're going to let you know about yet another opportunity for you to plug in and serve in our community. Hi friends, we're on location again this week, but this time we're at the Good Shepherd Ministry Center, and I'm here with my friend, uh, Susan Aslan, the director of the Good Shepherd Ministry Center. This is a wonderful place to serve and take care of others. So that reminds me that of our scripture uh, this week. Our scripture is about the blind man who encountered Jesus and became healed. Now Jesus created a healing balm and put it on his eyes and told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now the pool was considered sacred, but it was Jesus who healed him and took care of him. Now, at Foothills, we have many ministries where we care for other people, but here at the Good Shepherd, it is a wonderful place that has many ministries that care for people. We have the food pantry, which is where we are today. We have a clothing closet, a diaper program, yoga. We have a health clinic on site, a school on site, and even a place that houses refugees through the Safe Harbors program. It's a wonderful place where the center is centered on serving the community and caring for others. So I invited my friend Susan here to share with us how the, the center has grown in the last five years. Yes, this week's scripture definitely reminds me of the preconceptions we had for the Bethlehem Food Pantry five years ago. When we first reorganized and reopened, we expected to be serving mostly unhoused people, and we placed an emphasis on getting food that was in uh, tin cans with pop-top lids and things that could be easily microwaved. Um, but I was blind to the fact that uh, God had another plan, um, because in fact, we serve about 300 people here every week, and most of them are housed and have access to kitchens. Many are Middle Eastern refugees who are looking for fresh fruits and vegetables and for milk and eggs. Um, canned foods are not even part of their culture. And so it's easy for me to understand uh, Jesus healing the blind man because I thought I knew everything, uh, mm -hmm. but my vision had been obscured. Mm -hmm. And so through lots of prayer and reflection and through our research and uh, looking at the needs of others, uh, we have changed our approach here at the pantry, mm -hmm. and so we are better serving our community now. Oh, it's so wonderful, and it really is a wonderful place to serve. So please contact Susan if you are looking for a place to serve and help take care of others. And we also invite you to join us on Wednesday night at the Linton Study. We will do a service project together and, and uh, that will help the pantry. So we invite you to come, and that's all you have to do is just come um, and be open to sharing Christ's love and helping to care for others. So thanks for watching, and I look forward to serving with you. Thank you, Susan, uh, for helping me with that. And so um, thank you guys for when I call on you and ask you to help me with things that you always say yes. So thank you for that. 
Uh, now, uh, kids and youth, if you would like to go to Kids Connect, you can do so at this time. We have our volunteers right out those doors. Have fun, and let's continue to worship. <laughs> To our time, our prayer time together, uh, we lift up several concerns. Uh, a friend of Denise Serino's passed away this week, so we lift up prayers and assurance for the family of Kenneth B. We also lift up prayers of sympathy for Tammy Stiles upon the passing of her brother Patrick. And we have three quilts today in which we invite you to say prayers and tie a knot, uh, even if that is done virtually. We pray for Vincent Pereno, a Teresa Herb's father who fell and broke his leg and ankle. So prayers for a strong recovery and relief from pain. We also pray for Chrissy Baker's uh, aunt, Barbara Bransky, who is struggling through pneumonia while also grieving the loss of her twin sister, Carol, yesterday. And then we also lift up Chrissy's aunt, Jean Vandenberg, who is the partner of Barbara Bransky. Uh, Jean was helping take care of both Carol and Barbara as they go through this difficult time. And we invite you to uh, come and celebrate the life of Margie Fitchett on this Saturday, March 25th at 2 o'clock p.m. Um, as we have her memorial service here in the sanctuary. So we invite you to come and be a part of that. And now we invite you to visit the prayer stations if you'd like to light a candle in someone's memory or light a candle that symbolizes your prayer. So let us prepare our hearts for prayer as witness leads us in this time of centering, followed by silent prayer and meditation. Sweet. 
healing God, we bring you our afflictions, the pain, heart wounds, and challenges that we face every day. Some pass by us and don't notice us. Some judge us and say we're at fault or have caused our affliction. Some pity us but don't truly help our situation. But you, compassionate God, come to us and heal us. You place a healing balm upon us and give instructions to go and wash. When we do, we feel our affliction lift with the weighty balm and we see your healing power. Help us to always see that we need you. Don't let us become blind to your healing powers. Help us to always see you in all the people and situations around us. Keep us from becoming blind to others. We pray for those who are in need of your healing grace. We pray for healing for those who are sick and recovering from recent hospitalizations and surgeries. We pray for peaceful transitions for those on hospice and for their caregivers and family. We pray for comfort for those who grieve losses. We pray for those who need the basic necessities in life and those who suffer from family estrangement. We pray for those who encounter bullies every day. We pray that they may receive your encompassing love. We pray for those experiencing extreme weather emergencies and pray they will receive the help they need. We pray for your church that it will continue to be a light in the community and in the world. All of us need your healing grace in some way, gracious Lord. Come to us and give us what we need. Then give us the courage to tell others about your compassionate love. Thank you for seeing us and thank you for healing us. Our hearts are filled with gratitude as we sing together the prayer Jesus taught. During this season of Lent, our sermon series is entitled Encountering Jesus, and we've been focusing on these encounters that Jesus has with various individuals and groups from the Gospel of John. And all of these are fairly long uh, scripture passages of 40 plus verses. So as we get set up here, and I invite uh, our members of our congregation who are participating to come forward to have you have an opportunity to hear this encounter in different voices as we try to bring life to the Word. Amen. 
As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? It is he. No, but it is someone like him. I am he. Then how were your eyes opened? The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And then I went and washed and received my sight. Where is he? I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. He is a prophet. Some of the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. And his parents said this because they were afraid, for the Jews in power had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind. Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Well, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. Now, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. And never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. You were born entirely in sins, and you're trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard they had driven him out, and when he found out, when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we're not blind, are we? If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
thank you to everyone who participated in our scripture reading. I just want to let you know that at the 8.30 service, someone threatened to actually take mud and spit in it and put it in my eyes, but <laughs> we avoided that, thank goodness. Let us pray. O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of those gathered together be acceptable unto you, O oh Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So we're now over halfway through our Lenten journey together and nearing Holy Week. And along the way, we have had these encounters between Jesus and others. We heard how Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, his midnight theological discussion with Nicodemus, and his deep conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. And in each of these encounters, when we look at them, we see that something changes, that the people who meet with Jesus have a new understanding of God, something different than they came in with. For Nicodemus, it was this understanding of a spiritual new birth. And for the woman at the well, it was about living water that Jesus provides and quenches spiritual thirst. So today, in this encounter with the man born blind, Jesus teaches us about spiritual blindness. Now, there are four different stories of Jesus healing the blind in the Bible, including the one today that we have from the Gospel of John. And they're traveling from village to village, Jesus and his disciples, and they come across this man who has been blind since birth. And the disciples point to the man and they ask a theological question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now the reason they ask this question is because it was a common belief at that time that if someone had a physical or mental disability, it must have been caused by some type of sin, either committed by the person themselves or their parents or ancestors. And it does even say that in the Ten Commandments, the one regarding the worship of idols. It says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. That from Exodus. Therefore, the assumption always was that somebody sinned to cause this man to be blind. And they want to know who is to blame. Now, if you think about it, this is the very same theological question that's raised in the book of Job. You know how Job suffers all of these losses, the death of his family and the loss of his fortune and devastating illness and in the midst of this his friends come to him and said well you must have done something wrong to deserve all this in fact they tell job to confess his sins for obviously you have sinned in order to rectify this situation but job steadfastly denies that all through the entire book he says he's done nothing wrong and in fact demands an explanation from God. Well, Jesus also does not accept the assumption behind this situation. He tells the disciples, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And then as you heard, he proceeds to heal the blind man, taking the mud and the spit and placing it upon his eyes, and then telling him to go to the pool of Siloam, which is right at the city gates of Jerusalem. And he goes there and washes, and lo and behold, he can see. Now, you might expect the story to end there, happy ending, right? But the effects of this healing are far-reaching. It's all about the conversations that follow the healing. 
the ones between the blind man and the neighbors, the blind man and the Pharisees, the Pharisees with Jesus. All of them center on the topic of sin. Specifically, who sinned? The blind man, his parents, Jesus. In fact, when they interrogated the blind man, they called Jesus a sinner for healing on the Sabbath. And when they asked the blind man what he thought, he called Jesus a prophet. They weren't satisfied, of course, so the Pharisees went to the parents demanding an answer, but they were so intimidated and feared retribution that they told him to go back and ask the son. And when they did that, that's when the blind man who can now see pushed them over the edge. He said, look, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. If this man, Jesus, were not from God, he could do nothing. And that was it. That was the last straw for the Pharisees. They accused the blind man of being born into sin and kicked him out of the congregation. Friends, witnessing to God's love in Christ comes at a great cost because God's grace is difficult to comprehend. Our human inclination is to put everything in its place, right? Good and evil, righteousness and sin, clean and unclean. And yet now you have Jesus jumping in and turning things upside down. He says the blind man did not sin. The parents did not sin. Jesus himself did not sin. Well, surely we are not blind, the Pharisees say. And then Jesus sticks it to them. If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. And now we've come for a circle because remember how this story started? The disciples asking the question, who sinned? Who sinned? And the answer, apparently, are those who accused everyone else of sinning. The spiritual blindness that is revealed in this story is about judgment and self-righteousness. The temptation is always to blame others for everything that is wrong in the world and to fail to see our own culpability in it. Pharisees charged that Jesus had sinned when he healed and fed the hungry even on the Sabbath. But Jesus had a greater priority. That was compassion and care for those in need. And when he saw suffering in others, he called not only to see them as something or someone who's done something wrong, but as brothers or sisters who need God's love in that time. And I would dare say we hope that somebody will love and care for us in our time of need and not ask those questions. You notice probably at the beginning of the service and probably every week that here at Foothills, we have many opportunities to put what we hear and learn from Jesus into action. And whether it's volunteering at the Bethlehem Food Pantry or Shepherd's Closet or delivering meals to seniors through our Meals on Wheels program or supporting low-income families through Common Ground, we focus on serving those in need in our community. And we don't ask questions about why people are in need or assign blame for why they are in their predicament. We simply see a need and give of our time and talents and material gifts to help them. Why? Well, because that's what Jesus did. He cared for others without qualification. 
Thomas Akempis was a German monk. He lived way back in the 15th century. And he wrote four little devotional booklets in the early 1400s that were brought together and they became known as the Imitation of Christ. And in these devotionals, Akempis stated what the primary requirement was for living an authentic Christian life. This is what he said. We must imitate Christ's life and his ways if we are to be truly enlightened and set free from the darkness of our hearts. Let it be the most important thing we do then to reflect on the life of Christ. And this work, the imitation of Christ, became the equivalent of what we would call today a number one New York Times bestseller. It was translated into multiple languages and made its way around Europe and then influenced religious figures and writers, including our own founder, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. John Wesley then wrote that imitating the life of Christ was essential to our salvation, that we needed to walk the walk just as Jesus did. And that when we do that, we have a transformation through the pure love of God and neighbor. And that's why we emphasize putting faith into action. Because it's not only good and right to help others in need for moral reasons, but it's that helping others changes us. That we, in part, are saved when we do things that Jesus teaches us to do through our words and actions. And maybe this is the time for the church post-pandemic to get back to basics, to do what Jesus did, to do what Thomas Akempis wrote about, to do what John Wesley preached about, to imitate Christ and to be changed and that, that is where we will find the peace that we are so desperately looking for in our lives. You heard at the end of the story how the blind man had been ostracized and kicked out. So Jesus sought him and said to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, and who is he, sir? The blind man replies, you have seen him, Jesus said. You have seen him, and the one speaking to you is he. Lord, I believe, declared the blind man, who now indeed sees. The blind man's new sight allows him to see and believe what others cannot that the Messiah has arrived, that Jesus is the one who was promised by the prophets, the one who would usher in the reign of God. And the religious folk stuck to their old way of thinking, but the blind man who now sees understands God in a new way. And I think this is the seeing that Jesus wants for us in our lives. Because it's the outsiders like Nicodemus and the woman at the well and the blind man who have witnessed to the spiritual power of God through Christ. They are the ones who truly see Jesus' true identity. Through the ages in the church, our music has echoed this theme great Methodist hymn writer, John Wesley's brother Charles, wrote about it in O for a Thousand Tongues. We sang that hymn at the first service. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come, and leap, ye lame, for joy. And then again in 1779 with that hymn that everyone knows, the opening lines of Amazing Grace, John Newton wrote these words. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Friends, how shall our eyes be opened to the reality of Christ? Will we be like the Pharisees who insist on just one way of understanding? Or will we be like the man who was born blind, who has been given sight, and see that God is working in a new way in our lives? Amen. God indeed works in a variety of ways to meet us where we are, in our worship, in our prayers, in our witness and service to the world, and yes, in our giving. So thanks to all of you who support the church through your generous gifts. If you're in person and would like to make a gift today, there are baskets in the narthex as you depart. You may deposit them there. Or if you're with us online or anytime during the week, you'll see on the screen before you a variety of ways that you can give online to support our ministries. Let us give thanks to God and return thanks to God as we consider God's love and opening our eyes. And we give thanks for Lori Habel, who uh, is pinch hitting the day at the last minute, for Molly uh, to share with us our offertory with witness. shattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free amazing grace how sweet Now I am found was blind. 
thank you, witness. Let us pray. God, indeed, we are jars of clay, broken vessels, but you redeem us through your amazing grace. You fill us with your love, and you open our eyes to a new understanding of God through you. Continue to walk with us, O oh God, through this time, through the ups and downs, through the joys and sorrows. Lead us into that new life that you call us into as we prepare ourselves for Holy Week and for the resurrection on Easter Day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> to live my faith. Brothers and sisters, having our eyes now opened and filled with God's love, go and share it with the world. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every step I take is a step of faith. No matter where I wander, you're with me. Trust in